All right. I want to talk a little bit about how to analyze uh, cyber policy papers. And one of the key concepts when you're analyzing a cyber policy paper is the concept of granularity. Um, we're going to look at uh, one of the recent papers that just came out in foreign policy from an experienced cyber policy person. Uh, one of the things I try to do when um, I'm talking, especially when I do these videos for students, is making sure that people realize that there's no there's no ceiling really like you can read any of these papers and you are probably perfectly capable of performing a critical analysis of them and disagreeing with the authors so um you know don't be intimidated by a cv it's, a, it's something that i try to point out to people um so this is the erica longergan um you know, the cyber escalation fallacy, you know, the other thing I try to say when you're looking at some of these things is don't read too much into titles because a lot of times the titles are written to be, you know, eye-catching. A lot of times the author doesn't even write the title. So, but I think there is a discussion, there's a lot of churn in the current cyber policy papers back and forth on what the war in Ukraine is revealing about state-based hacking and what it's not revealing about state-based hacking. And the only sane discussion, realistically, would be it's too soon to tell. We don't know enough yet. The one thing we do know is that a lot of cyber policy, when it comes to state-based hacking, is under covert action. And just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, and you might see it later, if you're lucky. So I think it's too soon to tell, but you know, let's write a bunch of papers. Um, let's go over some things in this one, because it's not all about uh, the Ukrainian stuff. It also ties into a lot of other things. Um, first thing I want to say is, you know, we can read this. It says, uh, relatively limited role of cyber operations. Um, there's some evidence that at the start of the war, Russian-linked actors conducted a cyber attack against Viasat, a U.S.-based internet company that provides satellite internet to the Ukrainian military and to customers in Europe. So let's... Let's talk about that more specifically because I think there's a lot of weasel words in here. There's some evidence, Russian-linked actors, satellite internet to the Ukrainian military and to customers in Europe. So let's just say it appears that what happened was the Russians performed a sophisticated attack that denied usage of Viasat to Ukraine and people near Ukraine, which includes like, you know, even parts of Germany in some level. Uh, so that's a little bit of a less weaselly way to say it, right? That's a little bit of a less soft. A lot, of, a lot of cyber policy papers try to be as soft as possible. Sometimes you have to sort of just say stuff, just say it. Um, so the impact was temporary and more important did not meaningfully affect the Ukrainian military's ability to communicate. And right there, if you're a student reading this paper, I think you should say citation needed. Um, impact being temporary doesn't mean a whole lot when it comes to cyber actions, especially if the Russians thought the war was going to be over in three days. Maybe the impact being temporary is on purpose. Um, and th and that's, that's true for all military operations. A lot of time the impact is on purpose going to be temporary. Like when you bomb an airfield, sometimes you want that airfield easily repairable so that you can use the airfield, assuming you take that territory. Right? That's a normal thing. Um, but did not meaningfully affect the Ukrainian military's ability to communicate. We don't know that. That's a false statement, essentially, in this paper. We literally don't know what the impact was. The Ukrainian military was very cagey about it, and usually that means there was an impact. So I, I would put severe citation needed on that sentence. Um, Additionally, Ukrainian officials recently announced that the Sandworm Group attempted but failed to carry out a cyber attack against Ukraine's power grid. Sandworm Group is GRU, right? Like, I'm not an expert at cyber threat intelligence, but it's, like, again, it's, this is Russian military, right? So when the Russian military attempts to take out your power grid, that is a significant operation. They failed, but that doesn't mean they didn't try, um, uh, and, and when you're any, in any kind of combat of arms, some of your attacks fail. Actually, lots of attacks fail. 
So that's the funny thing about, like, if you haven't been involved, seriously involved in uh, cyber operations, you might think they have, like, a pretty good success rate. Um, maybe, or maybe you've only been in the really successful ones, right? So, like, if you're a student and, and you don't come from an, you know, an Intel community background, um, a failure could be a very common occurrence. No way to say. Um, anyway, uh, while the attackers appeared to gain access to the company, they were thwarted by effective defenses. We don't know what those defenses were yet. Uh, they could have been a lot of things. So I will leave that there. Uh, okay, so we've war simulations. There was a great paper that came out, uh, I believe, um, from Fisher Keller. Did I get that right? About how the war simulation work was real bad. So let's, uh, like, you need to be careful reading these papers that the, the things that people refer to, you often have to go dive into, figure out what the thoughts on that were. A um, uh, little evidence that cyber operations provide effective forms of coercion and they cause escalation. Okay, those are two completely different things. Co effective form of coercion, let's take as one argument, causing escalation to actual military conflict is a different argument. The reality is we don't have a lot of data on escalation. And when you're already in a war, you can't talk necessarily about different escalations because you're, you're sort of already escalated to a, to a certain level. Um, anyway, so much harder to use against targets of strategic significance or to achieve outcomes with decisive impacts, either on the battlefield or during crises short of war. So... I would say, uh, honestly, this is also wrong. Let's just put it this way. And, and there's a couple things I want to talk about here. Um, I want to give two examples. My first example is going to be the 2016 information operations and integrated operations where hacking was used and the data was leaked. Collecting all of like shadow brokers and the, um, the hacking of the DNC and a bunch of other things, I think... One thing that we've done, and that I think a lot of people do, is we want to be apolitical during our analysis, because otherwise your brain is clouded. Um, but that does not mean your adversary was apolitical. There's, if you spend a lot of time looking at the information operations, you will know that the Russians preferred Donald Trump. They were definitely looking to promote Donald Trump as president. Donald Trump became president. So... Did they make an impact is a question, but it, it, if you, you know, it's, it's definitely a coincidence, right? It, and if they did, in fact, make an impact, was that impact significant is a question you're going to ask. I think we've definitely, we've, in this country, we've definitely decided that we want to pretend that was not impactful because it makes us feel bad if it was. And that is another, I'm going to say, an analytical issue with a lot of people is underestimating impact because the, if the impact happens to you, you feel bad about it, right? So that's an issue. Um, anyway, let's talk about coercion. And I want to say, I, I, you know, when the 2014 hacking of Sony Pictures Entertainment happened, focused on the movie, The Interview, which you can see here in the middle of the screen, right? You can see that. Um, I immediately said, you know what, there's not going to be another, you know, major motion picture from America that is going to be focused on North Korea. Um, and, and if you look at it, we can go down the line, diplomats, all these, you know, go ahead, feel, click on all of these, click on all of these, when you go browse this Wikipedia site, click on all of them. These are all South Korean. Everything after the interview is a South Korean or Chinese movie. None of them are like, none of them are from like Sony Pictures Entertainment for sure. And definitely none of them are, are, are from other American studios, right? So, you know, before that, it's not that like Red Dawn was not that far before the interview, right? So um, they, they stopped. That's coercion working. Like, you have to be able to see these things. It works. Okay. And that's just an example. I just wanted to throw that one out there because it's fun. Um, at their most destructive, 
they rarely have effects in the physical world. No. Incorrect. Because when your company can't work, that's an effect in the physical world. Just because the building is standing doesn't mean that the, the people inside it are doing the same thing they used to do. And, I mean, sanctions are the same way, right? Like, if, if you can't get the parts you need to build the tanks, that doesn't mean I have to blow up the tank factory, right? So, um, I would just say be careful about these kinds of large statements uh, because they're not often that accurate. Okay, so, um, minor precision missile strike. Um, look, damage can be different things. It's just the reality of how it works. Just you can you can stop a ship from being effective using by not letting it uh, do its operations. It doesn't have to have a hole in the side of it. I think it's a weird way to think. Um, anyway. All right, so how, this is what I want, oh, I want to go, go here. Um, there's a little section here on hospitals or something. Um, all right, so we're going to, oh, here we go, hospitals right here. Hospitals and utility grids. Cyber power is hard to use. All right, let's talk about death. Let's talk about death. This is, goes back to granularity. How do you measure deaths per hospital per attack, right? So a granular way would to say would be like, I have one attack and it resulted in X deaths, right? Um, but can I kill half of a person? And the answer is, yeah, you kind of can. You can kill a percentage of a person. If I told you that by messing with navigation systems, I could kill on average on a day, you know, 30% more people on a highway, you'd say, oh my God, Right? Like, that is bad. That is, that is an act of war. But this is literally true when it comes to hospitals, right? If, if you take down their information systems, the mortality rates skyrocket. So what is that? Like, yeah, I can't directly point to this death is caused because this MRI machine lasered his brain. But I can say 30% more of you are dead, right? Like, on average, right? So... There's a lot of features in the world that operate on average, right? Like gravity operates on average. Heat operates on average. There's a lot of things that are not like literally a particle hitting your eyeball. So we need to, we need to sort of get over this idea that everything is going to be on a like one-to-one -one basis, right? So that's the first concept of granularity I want to talk about. All right, we're going to get deeper into granularity. I just want to look at like, you start seeing stuff like this, right? So National Cyber Power Index, United States, China, United Kingdom, Russia, Netherlands, France, Germany, Canada, whatever. I don't want to pick on the spell for paper too much, but um, let's talk about what the granularity is there. Because the granularity, as is the default granularity for almost all ana analytics, is per country, right? We're going per country. But why would you separate the United Kingdom from the United States and Canada and Australia in any chart on cyber power? Because they share a cyber, like a large part of their cyber power. They are linked economically. They're linked via the intelligence organizations. They're linked via a lot of different things, right? So it just makes it makes no sense to separate them. The only discernible way to put that chart together would have been by alliance, right? So. I want people to think when you first read these papers, are we at the right level of granularity? Should we be looking at an alliance? Should we be looking at a country? Should we be looking at a difference between um, the IC and the DOD and the law enforcement inside any particular country? Should we be looking per agency? Should this analytical technique have whatever it is be done per team, per small teams in those agencies, right? Because many agencies contain different teams, right? If I was doing DHS I'd, and I was figuring out analytical technique like Let's say I wanted to figure out who was pro-crypto versus anti-crypto, right? Like, I can't look at DHS because within DHS, I have multiple eight, multiple different subgroups, and some of those are pro-crypto and some of those are anti-crypto, right? Like, um, that can make a big difference when you're writing a policy paper, and most people choose whichever granularity gives them whatever result they want, right? So this is, again, it's a way of pushing, you know, bad an analysis right down your throat. So if you're a student... I want you to look for that. Um, and again, 
maybe you should be looking per person. If I'm, if I'm looking over time at cyber capabilities, maybe I should be looking literally at people and where they travel and how that works. And maybe that's how much data I need to do the analytics properly. And so what I'd like to say is like, obviously, as you go down the list, you get less data, right? Like if I look at cyber operations in a, a big alliance, they're going to be more points of data than per country, per, per agency, per team. I'm going to have, act so this is the other issue, right? Like, so if I go down, I have less data. If I go up, I have more data, but the data is all mixed up. So that's it. That is a key part of the analytics. When you're reading these papers, you have to make sure that you have to be critical. You have to say, they didn't get it right. What are they missing? That is how you beat people with a ton of years in this field is you have better analytical technique. Um, and what I want to ask you again is can you do sub-pixel resolution? Can you get below a human in terms of, like a human is basically the pixel on this set. Can I go to sub-pixel, right? Like, can I say, actually, the head of the FBI is semi, like they're kind of anti-crypto, but they're really kind of, when they leave the FBI, they're mysteriously always very pro-crypto. That's very weird. It's almost like they have multiple opinions at the same time, right? So these are, that's, that is something you want to start looking at if you're trying to do predictive analysis, right? And the goal of a lot of these papers should be to build a model that allows you to do predict, predictive analysis. I want to say, did I get this right? We're going to talk about that in the next section. So here's what's missing from a lot of papers. And I want you to read papers and say, is this in fact something that is missing from the papers that I'm reading? Um, what is, I want the papers to say this, what is the, my predictive result of my policy change using my model in multiple different time frames, right? So in five months, I expect to see this. In five years, I expect to see this. In 15 years, I expect to see this. Probably in one year, I expect to see something too, right? So I want to have multiple different granularities of prediction. And that way I can say, well, did I get lucky? Right, so if I predicted the right result at 15 years, but every year up to that I got it wrong, I probably got lucky, right? Like I, I happen, something happened, and I happened to be right in 15 years, but I wasn't right the rest of the time, right? So, but if if on the other hand I'm getting things right in five months and five years, and then all of a sudden other things happened, maybe maybe I'm you know there's a cone of predictive effect, right? So, um, you'll see this for people like proposing policies all the time is they don't want to predict anything, right? Like, what is the predicted effect of that new law where for 30 months, people, anyone with a clearance can't work for a company that has any outside government funding? We just learned that Twitter is funded by Saudi Arabia, so you couldn't do security work for Twitter. Uh, okay, well, maybe I want to work for a game industry. Oh, wait, but the game industries are all funded by China. Oh, so you can't work in the game industry. You can't work for Twitter. Can you work for other major firms? Oh, it turns out no, right? Like, so would you even know? Like, all of these things, like, what is the predicted effect of that law? Well, the predicted effect over five months is a lot of paperwork for a lot of people. Over five years, I'd say we'd probably see harder recruitment in the IC. It'd probably be more difficult, meaning we're going to have to pay more for the same amount of talent. Uh, and that includes contractors because the contractors used to be a way to pay more. But now I would say contracting rates are going to have to go up because the people in them are probably going to want 30 months of severance, right? Like, are we going to start seeing? So I'll, now I say, oh, wait, if I start seeing like national security companies pro start providing severance to people to account for that 30 months, that would be interesting. That would, that would certainly be an interesting predictive effect, right? So, and in 15 years, it's a little far out, I would say, Let's predict, um, you know, people not taking jobs. It'll be harder to get, so we won't solve our talent problem, right? So that's a larger statement, and obviously it's a gimme. Um, anyway, so uh, cyber statecraft. Let's talk about it. NSO Group is like, it's like for a while everybody was collecting Beanie Babies. You know, it's like it became a big focus of attention, and then it went away. And I think the same thing's going to happen here because there's, there's, you know, now there's Bitcoin. So instead of Beanie Babies, we collect Bitcoins, which are even sillier somehow. Like, I don't know if it was possible to be sillier than collecting Beanie Babies, but I think Bitcoin is sillier um, and equally viable. Um, but it's cool, right? Like, whatever. If, if it 
entertains you, that's great. Um, so the European Commission officials were targeted using NSO Group's Pegasus spyware. That's cool. Um, how are we going to handle that? So you get a bunch of policy papers, like a whole churn of them, right? Everyone typing away on the little policy papers. We sanction NSO Group, put them on the entity list, actually. Um, NSO Group fails. So here's what I'm predicting. NSO Group fails. No more iPhone remotes for our adversaries. And you, what you'll see proponents say is that we sent a message and uh, we've deterred this kind of company from forming. Right? So now, I, don't, I will say there's no more companies that form of NSO Group. Start. So I'm starting to make predictions. Right? So if you're writing a policy paper and you're, you're proposing this as your idea, what you're trying to say is NSO Group will, will fail. Our adversaries will have less capability. In, in five years, our adversaries will have less capability on iPhone than they do now. Uh, the message that we sent will be received. Um, and other companies of NSO's group type will not uh, be created because people know that they will run afoul of entity lists and sanctions and other pressure and lawsuits and whatnot. So those are your predictions, right? So like, you want that clearly stated. Like, that should be in the papers. It's not, but it should be in the papers. <coughs> Here are the questions that I like to ask. Are events likely to overtake the time frame of effect for the policy proposal in the paper? Right? So if I look at this and I say, well, what are the possible things that could happen here? Um, adversaries could develop their own native capabilities. Um, in places that don't care about our sanctions or entity lists, um, aka China, um, we could have people who sell these things um, to large customer sets, and same, you know, to Saudi Arabia again. Uh, we could have um, the market shift, so the market could shift significantly. People could just be doing training instead of um, selling the capability itself. We could have other issues. Things could go underground, right? So people could build companies that go underground. So, uh, so those are all things that could happen. We could start putting time frames on them, see if they, see if we can predict it, see if we can um, put likelihoods on these things. That's kind of what you'd want. You'd want like almost like a a likelihood, almost like a Gantt chart for your for your your policy actions. And one thing I will point out is messages. People like to talk about deterrence as if messages are, are in some sort of distributed computing platform and they're getting passed back and forth over some sort of reliable framework. And if you've worked at distributed computing, you know that's not the case. But also, um, I don't think we're communicating with the communities. And I think like the most communication you get is out of an indictment. But... Even that, like, if when you do an entity list or a sanction effort, like, who is the person who is broadcasting what happened and why and following up on it and communicating to everybody what the issue is? Nobody, right? So, and, and we rely on this concept of sort of strategic ambiguity because we're like, we don't want to tell people where red lines are because then they always walk up right up to the red lines. But sometimes you want to tell like, if you have kids, sometimes you got to give them a red line, right? Like, um, that's how that works. Communication is part of any relationship, whether it be adversarial or not. And if you're not doing communication, you are not doing deterrence. You are, you are doing wacky actions, right? Like, you are confusing. It's like you have a cat, and every so often you spank it. And that cat is like, why are you hitting me, man? Like, it doesn't know what you're doing, right? Like, because you're not communicating. The cats don't speak English. So, um, Anyway, uh, I read an article recently about how cats think, and it was fascinating. Um, so this is the thing, though. Our hackers' cats, well, they're closer to cats than they are to cyber policy experts. So they're probably not paying attention to your uh, very vague messages that you think you are sending. Um, and, and I would like... I would like to say, like, these are real issues, right? Like, we are, these are, this is what's happening. Like, it, the depth that you're, you're doing in your classrooms is no different from the depth that happens all the way up the chain, just with more information. Make sure you're doing the policy and analytics correctly. 
make sure that you have the granularity in your head. How granular is this argument? Are we talking countries? Are we talking groups within countries? What are we talking about? Um, make sure time frames are right. So that's the concept I wanted to go over today. Thank you so much for listening. Good luck with your papers. Please send me your thoughts.